Hi, I'm Nicky from Armstrong Customs and you're listening to the Functional Tennis Podcast. Welcome to episode 14 of the Functional Tennis Podcast. This week, we speak to Nikki from Unstrung Customs. Nikki talks about all things strings, racket customization, and even playing with Novak Djokovic and Andy Murray's rackets. We answer questions from our followers on Instagram, and we break it up into sections on strings, string and racket customization, and painting rackets. There's a lot of great questions in there, a lot of great answers, and stuff for me being 20 years in tennis, did not know about a lot of these things. So very insightful there. It's our longest episode by a mile. And if you're into string and want to know a little bit about Nikki from Unstrung, make sure you listen to this. Hi, Nikki. Welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast. Thank you very much. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. I've known about Unstrung Customs now for a long time. You've done some rackets for some friends of mine, uh, Dave O'Hare, Sam. You did rackets for Sam, did you? Yes, yeah, we did Sam, we did Dave uh, and a couple of others. Well. Great, and obviously I know your work with Andy Murray and Novak Djokovic. So yeah, and we've loads of questions to ask here. Our followers had asked loads of questions, so I can't wait to ask you them. Before we get into the stringing and the customization, where did tennis start for you, Nikki? Well, I started obviously playing tennis at a young age, I think, as, as, kind of, as a lot of us do. And then um, I was competing, I was traveling on the Futures Tour and... Um, you know, and trying to play professionally. And um, yeah, and that was obviously when we met back in, do you, remember, do you remember what year it was? I was trying to figure that out. I didn't go on to Google to search for results because I probably would have cried. But uh, <laughs> I, I think I think it was, it was about October, it was either October 2010 or 2011 in Greece. It was the Greece Future Circuit. Exactly, yeah. I remember it was in Greece. So it was in one of the islands in Heraklion. Or... Yeah, there was a few tournaments in the islands there and I decided to travel with the Irish lads. There was a good team of six or seven Irish lads. That was an amazing crew. And I said I'd give it a go for a month and see what would happen. But it wasn't, let's say, my late <laughs> stab at tennis started there and ended there. It was a great experience for me and to see how hard it is on the Futures Tour is extremely difficult. I know you were there with a good entourage. You were hanging out with Novak's brother Marco. Was that it? Yeah, that was actually the first time we, we met there. Yeah, it was just, there was a few of us that had come from, from the group that I trained with here in, uh, or that I trained with here in Spain. And that was, and that was the first time that, uh, that Mark and I met. And then obviously later he, he came to, to train with us. And, um, and yeah, he's one of my best friends now. So we, he lives here as well with, uh, in the same area as me. We used to train together, travel together. Great. So it wasn't you. So I, I remember there was, Marco used to just dress in Novak's clothes and use his rackets. And there was the other guy, still a Tano. I thought they used to just yeah, wear, yeah. No, they used to just raid Novak's wardrobe and wear all his clothes. Yeah, I mean, it's, the top guys get so much stuff, so it's um, so you know it's a shame that it goes that it that it was to waste anyway. So it's you know at least those guys were wearing it. So yeah, so that's where I first met you, and then I probably I was, did you play the Dublin Futures? I played once, yeah, but I don't remember again. I don't. It was a long time ago. So I don't know, but yeah, so um, I don't remember when that when that was. But yes, yeah, so I've played, and then I, I stopped playing relatively early when I was twenty. 24 more or less I started to, you know like I used off yeah and I moved on to other things When did string and start for you? Did you string while you were you stringing your own rackets while you are travelling? Yeah I've always been interested in stringing and customising and stuff I actually started learning when I was ooh, 14, 15 when I was out in actually out, out in Spain so the club that the small club that I that I was training at at the time they, the, the head coach there was also a stringer a good stringer and uh, he sort of first taught me to string and that was kind of where I, where where it all started, and I you know I started learning quite early on. And then growing up, I was always uh, there was a pro shop near where I lived in London, and that was where I was kind of able to practice more and and string more. And then obviously I was working there part time. And yeah, so stringing has always been um, like a passion, let's say, of mine. And uh, yeah, as, as I was traveling, I was always trying to find ways to sort of. Uh, find a machine to travel with or string as I was traveling or string, you know, for other players. Yeah, that was always kind of my, my thing. I know now there's the there's the pro stringer by Nathan Rubin who developed a small little stringer machine. What did you travel with back then? Yeah, I actually I was one I was actually one of the first guys to use the the pro stringer. 
back then. I um, just kind of discovered it quite early on, and I got in touch with Ruben, and we kind of yeah, he sent me sent me a machine to try and use, and I kind of tried to help promote them and stuff like that. It was um, yeah, actually, I really like the machine. I mean, obviously, it has its limitations, but as a machine to travel with, it's uh, in my opinion, it's the best one. So yeah, so I, I like I strung I don't know how many hundreds, maybe thousands of rackets on the, that little machine of. You know, I was able to string on a table, on a chair. I've, I've strung on, a, on the edge of a mini bar. I've, literally on any any flat surface, I've, able, I've been able to string a racket. Do you ever string an airport? No, no. <laughs> I'm not strung an airport, but I've strung, I've, yeah, literally on any any flat surface I could find, I've, I've, able, I've been able to string a racket. I must reach out to Ruben at some stage and we get a story on the invention of the machine on here because mm. it's such a genius idea. Yeah, it's really great. The whole concept of it and obviously he's developed it further so like when it when it started off it was the same size but it was like it had a dial so you had to turn to change the tension which which just means that you know the reading that you were getting maybe was slightly off but then once you found you know once you get used to it and you found your your range then uh then it was great and w- one of the things that's actually great about the machine is that it has um it has constant pull which i'll, I'll speak of a little bit about later on but it's yeah in such a small size and in such a handy machine it's really it's great Great. Well, yeah, we'll try to get him on. It's great that you like it. So you you were stringing from a young age. You got some work in the pro shop. When did your company, Unstrung Customs, come about? It came came about in 2014. I think we officially started. I had I've got two colleagues that that I knew separately, and I kind of been been speaking to both of them about the you know the possibility of setting something up a little bit more serious. At the time, we were just thinking of being you know like a stringing customizing company like you have the other big brands like p1 like ring roll and so we i kind of i had the idea to put the two like the three of us together and so i kind of yeah i headed up the business and we started in the end 2014 and then it's just kind of been growing bit by bit in the beginning it grew quite slowly because obviously it wasn't our number one main focus for any of us we understood that it would take perhaps a little bit longer than obviously if we were to go all in which we were fine with um but then through you know sort of our connections and our uh, and also the quite obviously i guess the quality of our work as well that it started to grow and grow and then obviously more in the last sort of year two years it's it's been doing doing nicely great because i know i know you string rackets for andy murray obviously for Djokovic, and you've good access to some good players which does help business yeah of course it does help it does help yeah my colleague darren who's in who's in the pro shop the one that i started uh learning to, well owned my stringing at in London which is uh, it's called the uh, Wimbledon Park Sports just next to, to the All England Club he strings for, for Andy whenever Andy's in London practicing uh, training he's, he's, he's stringing his rackets then I take care of Novak's rackets when he's when he's here in Spain being his pre-season um, yeah preparing the full tournament Is that shop the one beside Wimbledon in the little village? It's on the road actually between um, the tube station that you need to go to to get to Wimbledon which is called Southfield okay. and then walk like and then up up towards the uh, so like it's like a five minute walk up to the All England for the tennis club to the women championships. Did I see you? Was I in there once and I saw you in there? Yes, I think okay. so. exactly. Well, we met exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if that was PWP or it was this other store. Yeah, no, it's that one. It's just it's changed names a few times since. Then. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So now it's uh, just. So add on strong, your services involve obviously the basic stringing. You do racket customizations. Mm-hmm. You paint rackets, which is amazing, which we we'll talk about. You've done some amazing rackets. You do a bit of consultant. And you also now you have a new fancy 3D technology where you do custom palettes. Tell us about the custom palettes. I, I don't know too much about them. Yeah, so basically it was a couple of years ago. We were at, um, we were at a symposium, like a racket stringer symposium. And... There's, so, for, for example, for a lot of pro players, they have their own, they like a certain grip size, a certain shape, and therefore they actually, they have their grips molded to, you know, to the, to the shape and size that they like. And anyway, we were at the symposium and, um, there was a presentation on, um, on the molding. And, um, I mean, it's the way that it's always been done, but it was just quite time consuming. It's quite expensive, very expensive. And it was just, you know, one of those moments where you think, hmm, there's got, maybe there's like, there's got to be an easier way yeah. or a better way. And it, it just like, it just came to me. I was like, what? 
So maybe we can just 3D print these. And at the time, I didn't realize how much work it would be. Because, <laughs> you know, when you start, like, like with most things, when you think of 3D printing, you're like, oh, you just put it into a machine and it comes out and it'll be great. Obviously, with, with tennis rackets, the whole, you know, anyone that, that, you know, plays at like a good level, top level, want their racket to be the same at a certain weight. So obviously, any extra gram here or there, it makes a difference, you know. So there's no, you can't cut corners with regards to weight. So it, so yeah, it was like over a year and year and a half, nearly two years in testing to get to the finished product that we're at now. So it basically means that, for example, say you've played with head rackets your whole life yeah. and you really like the head the head shape and then but suddenly you played with a, know, a bad luck racket and it's the best racket you've ever played with but you don't like the shape of the grip at the moment there aren't really any I mean except for the molding option there aren't any ways for you to be able to play with that shape grip on that racket yeah until we came up with this idea to 3D print these pallets which basically means that sort of any competent stringer customizer is able to change change your pallet so they'd remove the foam that's there and then replace them with bit, like a head shape grip on your bubble racket well did I read somewhere that the cost of molding the grip is about £2,000 so for example if you want your own custom mould say you have your favourite racket with your favourite grip and it has to be that one then if you're on your own custom mould it's, it's £2,000 pounds for for a molding oh, yeah. and as a business as well each mold is two thousand pounds and you have to remember you need a mold for each grip size each grip shape you know you'll end up with an inventory of maybe a 30 mold two thousand pounds each or two thousand euros each is um is, a, is an expensive cost and for example say the company does a molding and you just want a standard size a standard shape it'll probably cost you around 80 to 90 pounds well euros 90 euros per racket but not only that you also have to send your rackets off they need the rackets for a couple of or probably a week because obviously the molding has to dry. And then with molding, for example, if you imagine when you take the foam off a racket, it's just the, the thin metal beam. I don't know if you've seen a hairpin of a of a racket yet. And then you set that in a mold. But obviously if that racket is just 1% off being completely level or completely centered, the effect that that has on the, on the molding, on the on the grip molding, is, is quite, it has quite a large impact. So, so the so the margin for error on that is, is quite large and it's quite um obviously it's dependent on the person doing it knowing what they're doing very very well because obviously if you just offset the racket or you don't I mean, I don't know, you just happen to knock it ever so slightly or whatever then you you know you mold it and your molding is going to be off the main aspect the great thing with uh, with the 3d palette with the printing system is that they're printed to 0.1 millimeter of accuracy which means that for example if i print you a palette today you can put it on your racket and it'll be perfect and obviously they come in two halves so they're obviously the racket's always going to be centered if i print the same palette in a year's time it's going to be exactly the same you know and you'll put it on and it'll be exactly the same it won't be dependent on the foam density it won't be dependent on you know on the racket being centered it won't be dependent on it on it on pretty much anything you know it's literally it's uh it's foolproof which is you know one of the large advantages of it so basically if i'm playing with i've been playing with head all my life changing to wilson and i prefer the the squarer head grip uh, i basically send you a message and say hey nikki i'd like some head pallets for my wilson size tree and you basically in a week or two or three however long it takes to 3d print them send them to me and i give them to my stringer and they can look after it exactly exactly i mean all the so it, we're actually we're, build, we're building a stock now at the moment which means so uh, i think actually in, uh, by the end of the month we'll have full range of stocks so people can order them directly from us you know we ship them out of, depending obviously where you are but it shouldn't take you know more than a couple of days to arrive and they cut they'll come with instructions on how to how to mount them and it's, it's very simple once you know how to do it it's very simple i mean if, if you can string and customize then it's you know it's not um you know it's not rocket science so it's quite simple yeah and then you know you you just order them from us and then you put the pallets on and, and that's it and you're good to go sounds good and tell me do andy and novak what palette do they use so andy has his grips molded if i remember rightly they were grip size two uh, sorry grip size are they two see i think so I two think two but he has a, his own personal mold so they're somewhere between a two and a three okay um so yeah he has his own personal mold that um that, that p1 do for him um on all his rackets and then um novak is just using regular palettes Okay. He's using regular um, head pallets in a grip size three. I did read somewhere that Andy's no longer with P1. Uh, I mean, well, now that he's sort of stopped playing, Makes I'm, not, sense. I'm not sure what, it, you know, it, you know, the, um, they do a great job, but they obviously, obviously, if you're not using their services at all the tournaments, I, I guess they're probably not cheap. But for example, I'm sure they might still do his rackets, you know, like his grip molding and stuff. There's, you know what, because obviously one, 
I think I, I mean, I'm not sure, obviously, I can't speak for them, but I think, you know, they do maybe just the customizing and then obviously they send you all your rackets. And then obviously as a company, you, they, you know, you can be part, like they'll be part of your team. They'll take care of your rackets at all the tournaments and so on. So I guess it's probably two different, you know, aspects. So you might not be with them in this, in the sense of, you know, they're not going to travel to, to his tournaments or string for him. You know, you can use the on-site string ears or not. I don't, I don't know who he's using, but I'm, I, I would assume that they're still going to customize his frames. But I, have, I, I, you know, I don't know. I've not. No, I don't know. I just listened to one of the guys run on a podcast. I think he was saying he didn't do Andy's rackets anymore. But as you say, maybe okay. maybe that's not tour and maybe they look after a batch every year. Yeah, maybe. Or I mean or, or not. I mean maybe he's maybe he's I don't know, maybe he's using I actually I don't yeah. know. I, I I can't I can't I can't say I, but I don't know. I did hear another thing. Andy does not like to give away his rackets, is that true? Yeah, that's true. He's very he, yeah, he doesn't like to give away his rackets. He keeps them. I know he's got a big room here in his house that I've seen photos of, you know, just with hundreds wow. of frames. Yeah, which I mean, I, I understand to a certain point because obviously, unfortunately, a lot, you know, a lot of people try to get, you know, pro rackets and then sell yes. them and make money off them and stuff like that, which is, which, you know, is not, not ideal. You know, one thing is, I'm sure, for example, you know, he, he, he gives them away to charity or to friends yes. or, you know, there are some serious collectors as well that are just, are in it for the rackets. You know, it's, it's different. If, you know, if, if you're, if you let's say trade rackets or tr- you know that you know that the interest is the rackets and not the money behind yes. the rackets, then it's I think it's different, you know. But obviously his, you know, if you if you have a racket of his that's been you know maybe he's played with it at Grand Slam or he's, even not even if as long as he's used it, you know, it could be worth a couple of thousand. I have seen there is a website out there that sells pro player rackets yeah. and they have some oh, yeah. they've Dimitrov's rackets there. I think at one stage yeah. I did see an Andy Murray racket there. I just don't know how to get their hands yeah. on these rackets. It's amazing because they No. Yeah, I mean, yeah, guy must have some good contacts. Yeah, there are always some good uh, uh, some good rackets on there. However, the prices are not so cheap. No. So, uh, even even they do the pro stock, the he- the pro stock Wilson, the H22s are some of the head special the made in Austria rackets and I, I just yeah. don't know how they can get their hands on 10 or 20 a batch of new rackets at a time no no I don't know either I don't know either I mean it's the sort of thing that I mean I guess if you if you know you create a business on it that's great but it's just yeah I like from from a person like obviously we, we get a lot of requests oh can you source these rackets oh do you sell these rackets yeah. and and we just we have a policy of just saying no because it well from a personal point of view I don't think it's it's um, yeah exactly it's not ethical from from you know from a brand perspective from the different brands you know it's you know one thing is if a player contacts us look do you have a contact to Wilson or to Head to try and get some frames then that's one thing you know to help yes. them get frames but you know to directly hey I'm looking for I don't know PT fifty seven A in a grip size three oh I want four <laughs> can you get me some you know we just always flat. Even if we could, it, it, we just we yeah. wouldn't do it because it's um, yeah, it's just not ethical. It's not you know, it's not right. So yeah, we kind of we we try and avoid all of that. You've played, you've hit with Murray with Andy's and Novak's racket. What are they like? Yeah, yeah, they um, are heavy for a start. They're heavy. Uh, what sort of weight are they? For well, for for Novak's frames, I mean, he was using as as you guys might know, he's, he changed that up kind of recently ever so slightly so he was using the same frame so the same racket which is a square beam it's an old radical mold and he was playing 1820 string patterns so in a and it's actually a 95 head so it's oh, it's quite a dense. dense string pattern yeah and um so I, actually i don't know if you know this so actually a lot all the a lot of the old head rackets that are advertised as 98 square inches so for example the prestige and everything say they're 98 they're actually head at the time measured them on the outside of the frame so the actual inside uh, head size is actually 95. So which rackets are these now? So these will be, uh, you know, the any of the, or even even the current the current the current Prestige, which mm. which if you look at the specs it says 98, but it's actually a 95 because it's actually 98 on the outside. But rumor has it that it might that might be changing for the for the for the next. Um, what they say on the the spec or the actual size of it? The just the size, just okay. the, just the head size itself. That's um, mad. It's just measured because normally you measure, for example, you normally measure a head size on the inside of a racket, like okay. the inside surface area of like uh, so of the string bed. But for whatever reason, ages ago, someone had measured them on the outside. <laughs> um, so obviously it makes it larger. So for example, so that just means that, for example, the, the Novak is playing with a 95 inch square inch head size. And yeah, I never the, knew uh, that. That's mad. And so it, that, that explains all my shanks anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. The, um, yeah, he plays heavy. He was using, a, I think he was at 360 
67, 368 grams with everything with grips. Uh, he plays with two over grips and a vibration dampener. And his swing weight was was high. It was in the 340 something area and then he was obviously he had a bit of trouble with the elbow and stuff and he was looking for a bit more power and so he just modified the his setup slightly so he's using an 18 19 string pattern and um and he's actually got half an inch longer on the frame so his frame is actually half an inch longer than it was before, which is not much but yeah, i guess he feels a slight difference it gives him a little bit more power also the 18 19 string pattern just opens up the string bed ever so slightly so he gets a little bit more power a little bit more spin and then he's reduced the weight a fair bit he's taken nearly 10 grams off i think if i remember right so he's down around 354 or something like that i think all in so so yeah just you know he's able to accelerate a little bit faster it takes a little bit of pressure off his off his joints and stuff so. and how did you find using the racket great i yeah i, I mean i like actually i personally i actually prefer the uh the 1820 i just I've, i guess i uh, I've always played very heavy. I mean, I, I was, I remember when I was 12, I was already using, do you remember the Dunlop 200G? Um, yes, the black one. The black one, yeah. The, uh, black gray, uh, beautiful oh, racket, yeah. Muscle weave. And that was, you know, already 315 grams on strong or 320 grams on strong. You know, so, so at 12, I was using like 350 gram racket pretty much. So I've always played very heavy. So for, I, I think they're great. I mean, the, the frame is very nice because it's solid. You get a lot of feedback from the frame, which is also why that you know for commercial use they're perhaps not perfect because they you know that it, unless you're playing with gut, unless you're in you know great physical shape, then then they can you know you could get injured. You know, there's a lot of feedback in the arm, you know, like this, that which is great. You get a lot of feeling from the ball. You get um you know a very clean, sweet spot, clean strike. However, it is a lot of pressure on the, on the arm, the wrist, you know, the joints. So um. But yeah, I mean, I like them very much. Um, yeah, they're, it's, a great, it's a great feeling frame. And is Andy Andy Murray's racket the same, roughly, not, wouldn't be roughly the same weight, is it? Yeah, he, he also actually quite a few years ago, he, I don't know if you remember, he changed weight. <clears throat> he was like, I can't remember exactly, but he was up in the 370 something wow. range. Yeah, also 1820. He was using the, the PC57A, which is just the old Pro Tour prestige is that's the blue one is it the blue and black one? exactly the blue and black one yeah yeah exactly exactly that one yes it was just obviously it was too much uh so he reduced the way he was for quite a while he was chopping and changing i think between string patterns i'm not sure what he's using now what he was using most recently but he is he dropped weight a lot to he went down from 370 380 down to three just under 360 i think <laughs> for them you know it just means that they can accelerate faster they can you know obviously having to hit just repeatedly hit you know aggressive top spin or angles or anytime you have to move the racket slightly when you're at position or you're defending like those 10 10 15 grams make a big big difference he's a 95 head also so yeah exactly Exactly. So that's a 95 head as well. Yeah. The, the funny thing with that racket is the racket he uses, the PT-57A, has a lot of, like, it's like, let's say it's a famous pro stock racket. Like a lot of people look for it, you know, it has, it just has a name, but it's actually, you know, if you take the current prestige, the regular prestige, it's the same mold, you know, it's the same shape. You could, you know, for example, if, if I gave you a pro stock, you know, it's like the PT-57A and the current model paint with the same paint job, there is no way to tell the difference, like none whatsoever. It's just that the, the layup can be slightly different. The, the flex of the PT57A, I think, is a little bit lower. Again, because back then, the power levels were lower in the frames. The flexion of the racket was normally around 59 RA, which is just the unit that the rackets are measured in in, in flex. Whereas like I think the, the retail frames are a little bit higher. It just means that the racket's a bit more solid on impact. It gives you a little bit more power. Again, just to, I think, to enlarge the sweet spot slightly, just to, again, make them a little bit more playable. Because again, for example, and, you know, there's a reason that the top pros are using a certain racket, but they're also in, in a certain physical shape and have a certain ability to use those frames, you know. So so from, like, it doesn't really make sense that, you know, that you're, the recreational player should be using the same the same setup or the same frame as, you know, one of the, two of the fittest players ever to play the game. It's a, it's a bit like uh, a race that, car. Like, exactly. They're just so highly configured that if a normal driver doesn't know how to use the proper race car, they're not going to get the most out of it. So you need to be trained in the profession. And I used to use, James McGee used to give me his racket. So he used to use prestigious and I had loads of them, but I realized they're not for me. And then he made the switch to Radical and it was such a nicer racket for me. Now he had, his setup was a bit either different string bed than the standard racket. It was a bit different, which I got used and I thought was a great racket. And and which I still, I sort of use a radical now, which is roughly the same setup as it. But 
definitely the prestige you got to be a gifted player to use but do you I know that that old prestige the balloon that a lot of players use come from a certain generation what's the popular racket now with players I think a lot of the players let's say like the the younger generation a lot of them using the blade and the radical are the two kind of two of the sort of brackets that are kind of getting a lot of attention at the moment is it the current blade or is it a is it a H I know their their stock models are H22 H19 Wilson do they do what the most popular player frame is a frame called the H22 which is what Noah was using when he was at Wilson and that's very similar to the frame to the old sort of square beam radical you know like the I radical oh, or yes. the you know that, that that kind of generation or the liquid metal radical that it's kind of like that looks and feels kind of similar to that I guess I mean the Wilson have their own you know have their own materials a lot of their players pro players use use that but a lot of them are also using the, the regular blade whether obviously to say which which model they're using is difficult to say they normally use like the pro stock rackets from all the brands are always gloss well nearly always gloss so for example you know Goffin is using a blade just in gloss paint he doesn't use you know that that kind of rubbery texture why paint. is that um i think maybe it's just feeling in the hand you know that obviously you're just used to that feeling okay like, you know i i don't i don't know uh i don't uh, specific reason it's not that it looks better in photos or ah uh, maybe yeah i mean no i, th- I think i mean i I think at the end of the day, for example, if Goffin wanted to use the frame that you could actually, you know, looks exact or is exactly the same, you know, that he would. I think it's more a question of of personal, of preference, you know, or, or, you know, that obviously the blade did used to be gloss. So he was using the blade back when it was gloss. And then, um, you know, they changed the paint on it, but he still liked the feeling because that's what he's been used to, you know, and also the Canadian, Raunich, he's also using the blade. Yeah, there are a lot of players using the blade, but, you know, it's a great frame. And then also the Radical, you know, you have Taylor Fritz using it, you have Schwarzman, um, Sloan Stevens so they're kind of the more popular frames I guess at the moment and I think yeah I think that generation kind of prestige generation is slowly slowly dying, dying. yeah I think so unfortunately unless yeah makes uh, sense yeah it makes sense um, unless kind of tennis starts to shift to being you know faster again I can't see you know it's going to be tough for them for that kind of style of racket to survive doesn't matter how big or strong you are you need you need some help from your friend you know there's no, no there's no point of using a racket that that has, you know, a two inch um, sweet spot, you know, and a power, yes. and a low power level. If, you know, if someone the same size and build is using, you know, something a lot more powerful and a lot more forgiving. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Those days are over. But yeah, thanks for telling us some secrets of those rackets. We're going to break into the Q&A now that our followers, the questions they've left us now. I'm going to split it into five sections. It's going to be a section on stringing, a section on strings, a section on rackets which we've talked about some of the questions already, a section on racket customization. And then we have a couple of questions on your painting of rackets, Perfect. which is amazing. Yeah. So I'm going to kick into it. I know you. I've sent you the questions there. We start with stringing. Now I have some of the names, the people who left questions, okay. some others I don't because their Instagram handles don't say their name, they yeah. say other things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm going to quickly jump into string and here. It's yeah. a question from William. Uh, yeah. Why do people have higher tension on mains and than on the crosses? So basically, I mean, from just from kind of like a physics point of view, obviously, if you if you look at the length of the mains compared to the length of the crosses, there's obviously quite a significant difference in um, in length. So just obviously, if you have a lo- the longer the piece of a longer piece of string at the same tension as a shorter piece of string, the ten- like the tension on that shorter piece of string will be higher. So it basically means that, for example, if you have the string racket uh, all the same tension, which is totally fine, and a lot of players do, it just means that the crosses are going to be relatively tighter than the mains, which in some frames can actually, at very high tensions, can actually kind of change the shape of the racket ever so slightly. You will also get a little bit better kind of trampoline effect if you lower the tension in the crosses. It will just allow the mains to move slightly more, uh, just a little bit more. And so I personally, I'd always recommend going a kilo or two pounds less in the crosses. So for example, say you string at 25 kilos, which is 55 pounds. I recommend stringing, you know, 25 in the main, 24 in the crosses or 55 pounds and uh, 53 pounds. You're just going to feel, you should feel anyway, that that the ball is going to just pop a little bit more 
But like I said, there are players that do, you know, there are many top players that do use the same tension all round. So there's no, it's not necessarily wrong. The only thing I wouldn't do is ever have the main types and the crosses. Then you yeah. end up, then you end up with like a round head, and that's not good for the bracket. Great. So okay, that's good. I know Fran, <laughs> your partner, has told me to string racks and make sure you go. I'd probably string a fifty-four. He goes do fifty-four, fifty-two. But I actually never knew the reason for it. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. great to know that. Next question is: What is a pre-stretch now? I'm just going to quickly mm-hmm. jump in here. Whatever, 20 years getting racket strong, nobody's ever mentioned pre-stretch <laughs> to me. And yeah. I did see even Serena Wilson put up a picture of Serena's racket getting her label on a racket for the US Open had like 10% pre-stretch. What does that mean? So pre-stretch is something that you generally only do with, with natural gut. There are, strangely, some players that do it with polyester string, but I definitely wouldn't recommend it. So basically it means you, you can only do this on, well, you can only really do this on, ele- on, you know, on the electric machine. So basically what it means is, say you string a racket, you're stringing gut mains, for example, and you have, you want to string at 24 kilos. And what pre-stretch does, pulls the string, whatever percentage you set it at. So say you set it at 10% pre-stretch, which is kind of the norm. It means it'll, it'll pull it at 10% more of your tension and then go back to... To 20. So say, for example, you're pulling at 24 kilos. Uh, you want your racket at 24 kilos. You put the string in the in the machine. It pulls it back at 24. Then it adds 10% more. So it'll pull it to 26.4. And then it'll go back to 24. And then it'll beep. And then you can put the clamp. What this does, it just removes a little bit of the elasticity in the string, which for, because especially with um, natural gut, it's quite a lively, quite a dynamic string. So just by pre-stretching it, it, it makes it slightly stiffer and just reduces that extra elasticity. Funnily enough, Dabalat, who are probably the sort of leaders in natural gut they actually don't recommend it however nearly most nearly all the players kind of use it interesting yeah well i don't think many people use natural gut so no so it's not you know i yeah i wouldn't recommend trying to pre-stretch polyester because again you just it's gonna get up with a very dead string bed if you pre-stretch polyester great yeah i did read uh, only recently heard about bablot that what they used to do is offer if you use the bablot racket back in the day they give you free Good, and mm-hmm. that's how they that's how they grew their brand. Yeah. That's how they grew so quickly yeah, because exactly. they used to offer the free good. Okay, so this is an interesting one. The next one, it's mm-hmm. and it's a simple but interesting because I find it's a lazy stringers option. Okay. But two knots versus four knots. What's the yeah. difference? So I mean, there's no again. So this. Uh, a lot of the sort of meeting or symposiums that we go to it always is a question that always comes up um, there's no right or wrong for two knots or four knots only obviously so it basically means you can obviously string two knots as if you string the whole racket with one piece of string uh, so obviously you end up just with two knots and four knots is if you string the mains tie off the the mains and then you start with a new piece of string and you, and you string the crosses and you end up with four knots obviously if you use two different string types of string you have to use four knots obviously a lot of players also use the same string all over and generally these days, most players actually ask for four knots. They, if you were to ask them why, they wouldn't really know. There is no right or wrong. It just, it makes stringing easier because some, if for example, if you, some rackets, depending on their, um, on their string pattern, you even end up, you know, with the, with the main finishing at the bottom and then you need to know how to get back up to the top. So it just makes stringing slightly easier on string patterns that you aren't familiar with. A friend, a colleague of mine did a test a couple, a uh, year or kind of last year or the year before where you strung the same racket with the same tension in twice in t- two of them with uh, two knots and two of them with four knots same tension same string and same machine and for some reason the, the racket that was strung in one piece and two knots came out at one DT higher which is dynamic tension is this we have a little machine that goes on the string bed which reads the dynamic tension of the strings which is kind of what we gauge sort of for accuracy of stringing at, at tournaments and stuff and uh, and one DT point, one dynamic tension point is roughly half a kilo. So it just it just comes out ever so slightly tighter. Why? Not really sure. But there is no there's no right or wrong. So you can, you can do either. And what about main, would the four not maintain its tension any better? Any test done on over the as long as the outside mains like if if the racket's strung properly or by a good stringer, they both play. The, I mean, they'll both maintain the tension the same. There won't be any extra tension loss because of, you know, having more knots. The only, obviously, two knots looks nicer, I guess. You only have two knots, but sometimes you need, you need, you know, sometimes in some uh, cases you need a more experienced stringer to string uh, two knots on certain rackets. Okay. I thought it was, I actually thought it was the other way around that the mm. two knots was a lot easier. But okay, so there's no real difference there. I know pros used to string a lot higher the tension. They seem to have come down. So mm-hmm. what's the average tension that the pros are stringing at? Ah. Uh, 
to be honest, there is no that they vary so so greatly that there is no average. There's no kind of trend neither. The players that are using gut are generally stringing a lot tighter. So, for example, the ones that are using a gut, a mixture of gut mains and polyester crosses, or or uh, all the reverse, are generally stringing between 25 to 28 kilos, roughly. And then the ones that are using all poly are generally a little bit lower, sort of. I mean, there are there are players stringing at even 14, 14. kilos, you know. So, yeah. What's 14. that in pounds? About 40, is it? It's 30.8 pounds, so 31 pounds. Is it a trampoline they're playing with? <laughs> Yeah, literally, literally. I mean, I think I can't remember who it was. I remember my colleague telling me that their lowest tension at Wimbledon this year was who was it? But it was something like twenty seven and a half pounds. Yeah, it's mad, mad. But it, so it just really goes on on personal preference, you know. I mean, for example, Novak is on the high end; he plays around twenty eight and a half kilos, but he is using gut. And then, yeah, like I said, there are players all the way down, um, you know, in the thirty pound mark. So it just, it really, really depends on personal preference. Well, well. Okay, so what's a good stringing machine for a junior player or somebody who likes to string, a recreational stringer? For example, I mean, like we spoke earlier about the uh, the pro stringer, which for like a junior, I think is great. You know, they might be traveling to tournaments, they can take it with them. It's an electric machine. It has constant pull. So constant pull basically means that when the tension head pulls the string, it keeps the string at that tension for example, if you put your finger and push down on the string, the tension on the head will adjust to constantly keep the string at the right tension. So, for example, a crank machine doesn't have constant pull. You pull the string to the tension that you want, and that's it. You know, so if you were to push on that string, that there would be no adjustment. Funny enough, actually, drop weight machines are constant pull because they're constantly pulling that tension on the string. So actually, in, in per, like if personally, sometimes the like a good drop weight machine can actually be a little bit better than a than a crank machine. In my in, what's yeah. a drop? I, I excuse so me. A drop weight machine to... is if you remember the old sort of this slightly smaller machines. They have like um, a long pole and then with a weight at the top. Okay. And then that weight drops. You have to move the weight along the bar okay. uh, to set the right tension. So as that weight drops, it then pulls like a lever, pulls like a um, pulls the um, the string to that tension. But then because the weight is obviously constantly on the string, it actually makes it a constant pull. So anyway, in answer to your question, you kind of have two categories of. If we just kind of stick to electric machines, you can pick up a nice electric machine. You know, a second a good second hand electric machine around five hundred. 500 euros, 500 pounds. What brand would that be? You have a couple from Gamma do nice string machine. Pro, Pro, Pro do, do, do some good machines. There, there are quite a few out okay. there. Yeah, like I said, sort of the things to look out for, you have kind of, with electric machines, you have, I don't know if you've seen the ones that they have like a circle disc. You thread the string through the circle disc and that string then turns, which is generally what you'll get in the sort of slightly lower range. I mean, they're, they're great. They'll do the job perfectly. Just... If you're stringing it like against a lot of rackets or quite uh, delicate strings, then it could be problematic. But if you're, you know, if you're stringing just your own rackets for, you know, club players, yeah. you know, friends, stuff like that, then it's great. Because otherwise, if you do want a good machine, then you're gonna have, probably gonna have to spend sort of close to two thousand yeah. euros. I like when people ask me, I'd always say either stick to under a thousand or take the next step up and and go kind of close to two thousand euros. But you reckon you think the pro stringer is good for a junior player who's might travel a little bit as well, they can bring it with them and they have their constant pull. Yeah, I, I yeah, it's good. I think it's like I, I always liked it. I mean it's it's one of those things that a lot of stringers don't like and it's different. It's, oh well you know, it doesn't clamp the racket quite properly. It doesn't do this, doesn't do that. But Obviously, like I've you know I've been on tour, I've seen some of the stringers at at tournaments, and um, even quite recently that you just you just see and you're just like it's not it's not good. So so I I think the pro like I've always I've always loved it. I mean I, I strung a lot of rackets on it. Yeah, I think it's a great option, especially for the price. I think it's really good. That's good. Ruben will be happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are some big do's and don'ts for stringing? There are a couple of basic let's say rules if you're starting out stringing always always string from the middle so when you start the racket you put the, racket, the strings in the middle in the center and you work outwards so I've, you know there are old techniques or let's say not quite right techniques where you tie you actually weave all the strings you, you tie a knot on one side and then you start pulling the strings across on the mains which is really not good for not for the racket not for the string job not for any anything so always always start the mains from the uh, from the middle and try and keep it if you can 
kind of even a couple of strings one side, a couple of strings the other side. Because obviously, if you imagine that if you, for example, if you start on one side, tie the knot and go all the way across, mm. you're pulling a lot of tension on one side and, and the racket's going to end up in a in a funny shape. The sweet spot will be off. Yeah, it's going to be not a great job. And then when the same thing with the mains, uh, with the crosses, sorry, I always personally recommend, you should always, I always think you should start the crosses at the top. There are some rackets or some rumors, that, oh no, you, uh, apparently they say you should start at the bottom. I you know, just, I mean, all tournament stringing I've done, all sort of tour level stringing, doesn't matter the racket, we always start the crosses at the top. And that's when, when I was th- talking about two knots versus four knots. Sometimes you're going to have, uh, if you string in one piece, so in two knots, sometimes you finish the mains at the bottom of the racket and then you, you think, okay, how, how am I going to get the racket? Uh, how, then I have to start at the bottom. But there's actually a technique, it's called Around the World. I'm sure there are some YouTube videos, there are loads of videos on it, which basically means it's a way of managing the string so you end up finishing with the strings for the crosses at the top and then you can still work your way down. So yeah, I'd always recommend start like the main strings from the middle on out and the crosses from top to bottom always they're kind of the two main two main factors and okay so that's that should be enough to get somebody stringing yeah okay great okay so this is something I've I've seen the website mention I'm not sure if they even got in contact with me about some promotion but I've seen the Sergetti method Mm -hmm. I've read about that they say they have a bigger sweet spot than the average way of string the racket I did check out their website and they don't seem to have any current top pros using this method endorsing it so is it just all marketing what exactly is the the Sergetti method of stringing yeah I mean from so basically the Sergetti method is the kind of what I spoke about earlier about the sort of having a different tension to mains and crosses that each string is actually strung at a different tension slightly slightly again you need a good electric machine to be able to do this you know because if you're changing the you're having to change pretty much every string by point x of a of a kilo or a pound i know a few guys that have used it and that really like it and the guys that do use it swear by it however but also being a stringer i just it's like it's very tired sounds like a nightmare you know, it, 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 yeah it is so i personally don't recommend it just because there's also a reason that if, if it was really that great there would be you know a lot more players using it Personally, I think, you know, sometimes, in my opinion, often people try and reinvent the wheel when, you know, when it's not necessary. Not to say that, you know, that it, they might be right that it increases a sweet spot. However, it just, is it worth all that time it takes? Like, you know, see, I can, we string rackets between, you know, 15, 20 minutes a racket, you know, and, and this will take us maybe 40, 45, yeah. you know, and, and either we have to charge more, you know, or it just takes that much longer. And it's just something that, yeah, just, I mean, I know players have tried it, you know, even good players have tried it. Cause all players are always looking for that little bit extra and if they could get that little bit extra they would be using it so i just i yeah that's that's kind of my take on it but the theory behind it does make sense you know that obviously that each string on a racket does have a slightly different length you know there are very few strings of exactly the same length from top to bottom or from side to side so the theory makes sense it just it just makes everything a lot more tricky it's what i thought i didn't know about the time consumption that makes it even worse so thanks for that exactly uh, we're going to move on to strings now, so we should be able to quickly move through these. Yep. I want to get some new strings. What's the best way for me to find a new string that I may like? Like, do I speak to a stringer? Do I have to test loads of strings? What's the best and possibly quickest way to find a string that I may like? The best thing to do is to speak to a, to a stringer, to you know, either the stringer that you use or, or a different one, you know, so you can... Um, you know, online or, or, you know, find a good-looking pro shop and speak to them. Obviously, just try and... If if you do go in asking, or if you do contact someone asking for, you know, for for a new string, try to go in with at least some idea of what you're using at the moment, because obviously uh, people often ask. For example, if if someone says to me, "Oh, I need a new string," string what should I use I'm like well I've not seen you play what string do you use oh I'm not sure what racket do you use mm, a blue one I'm like you know so that it's very difficult to go off but there are obviously there are two main well there are three main types of strings there's natural gut then there's synthetic gut which is a soft multi string so that means it's it's um, it's bra- uh, braided it's a braided um, string that is, is is generally a lot softer. You have more feel, they're more powerful. And then you have polyester strings that are uh, a lot stiffer. You get more more control, more spin. And they're kind of the three main types. For club players that play, recreational players that play fairly regularly, I generally recommend a hybrid because I think you get in, you get the, benefits of having a polyester string which where you get the spin you get the control you get the, the high impact but if you just if you use a full bed of poly it can be 
bad on the arm, can give you arm problems. So I, I always kind of recommend trying out a hybrid first. And then, I mean, there are lots of different types of strings. But again, for a lot of players, they might not feel all the differences. So it's more a question first finding out the kind of type of string you like. And then if you want to keep trying more strings, you can, within that range, you can kind of keep testing. There are hundreds of thousands of strings and they are all slightly different. However, I would just try to keep it simple. Never try more than three strings at once because otherwise you go crazy if you try too many. So stick to three different ones. One, okay, this one is quite powerful. This one is intermediate and this one is generally more control-based or something like that. And then kind of try to go from there. They're testing some new rackets from Wilson and also was testing different strings at the same time. And yeah. within three months, I'd give myself tennis elbow from just changing rackets mm-hmm. and strings. And yeah. I promised myself I won't do that again because it was totally involuntary. And tennis yeah. elbow can take, it was the middle of the summer by the time it started disappearing and was a complete yeah, yeah, yeah. ruin my summer. So when you do a hybrid with synthetic and poly, which goes where? Polyester string would go in the mains, in the vertical string, and then the synthetic would go in the crosses. This is going to give you the best thing. Because if, for example, with gut, you can use gut in the mains and you get a lot more power, but obviously gut is very expensive and breaks a lot easier. So generally, unless you're willing to spend a lot of money, I wouldn't really bother, to be honest, because it is it is very expensive. And so, yeah, so I would generally always go with the polyester in the mains uh, and then a synthetic in the in the crosses. And this actually goes for juniors as well. The, uh, there's actually a kind of a wave, kind of a, a stringers, we, we talk about it a lot, um, that there are too many juniors, young juniors using all poly strings, like a full bed of poly, which, like, it's not, it's really not good for their arms, for their wrists. Like a child, you know, like an 11-year-old, you, again, oh, but Rafa's using this string. I want to use that string. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, that you're not, you know, you're not Rafa. You don't have, you yeah. don't have the same biceps that Rafa does, you know. So, like, um, I always try and avoid kids use, any kid under the age of 12, in my opinion, shouldn't be using full polyester strength because, yeah, it's just not good for them. What's the unstrung customs? recommended hybrid string setup what two strings do you recommend oh that's i think it's a tough question because there are there are so many uh, i guess you uh, for example if we go through price range let's say there are perhaps three price points if we go for example high end you have uh, for example uh luxon hello power in the main and then you could have for example technify the x1 which is probably the best synthetic gut in the crosses and then you have a Sort of a mid-range, mid-price point, you have, uh, for example, like Headhawk, either the Hawk or the Hawk Touch in the mains. And then you could use their own. They have actually quite a nice soft string called Velocity MLT, which Who's is quite the Velocity nice string crosses, by, sorry? you could use Prince Synthetic oh, by, by Head, head okay. as well. So these are both head strings. So you've got like Headhawk or Headhawk Touch in the mains. And then you've got their, either their, their um, Synthetic in the crosses, uh, Head Velocity, MLT, or you could use Prince Synthetic Gut, which is very, very popular. Synthetic Gut Duraflex, which is, yeah, one of the sort of the most popular synthetic strings, especially in the UK. And then again, you have like a low price point. You could use, you know, like a an unknown brand of poly with kind of like a very, like a basic, you know, uh, Prince. I think it's called Tournament Synthetic Gut or something like that, which I wouldn't really recommend. I would kind of stick between the kind of the mid, if you can obviously, I mean, like with everything you get what you pay for you know so if, if like any anything between kind of the mid mid to high price range you're going to get more feeling you're going to get a better feedback the strings will generally last longer so sometimes it is worth paying a little bit more because you will get more playability out of them you will get more feedback from the string it'll be nicer on your arm you will get more power and control there is a reason that you know that certain strings do cost a lot of money yeah. um compared to other strings it's not it's not all just plastic it's yeah, not all so just branding. Is, no, no, no. I mean, sometimes yes, but like it's not all, not all because of, uh, of branding. So yeah, I mean, I think, for example, a hybrid. If it's the first time you try, stick, you know, between twenty to thirty pounds, you want to be spending twenty to thirty euros. Um, and then kind of go from there. I did earlier this year start using Luxon really for the first time in my life. Yeah, which one? The Alu Power. Alu Power Soft, and to be honest, the feel. And it was just, I think it helped my arms so much because it was so soft yeah. and mm-hmm. playability was great. Now, I thought the 4G playability, the feel out of the 4G was amazing. I'd never experienced yeah. anything like yeah. before, but, and I've yeah. never used natural guts, so I can't compare with that. But I thought the 4G sure. was great, but I thought it was not friendly on my arm at all. And I think that no, was probably what caused. I know they have a soft version now, but I haven't tried it, but I'm out of looks. Yeah. I'm actually out of looks on now. I don't hit the ball that hard and it breaks a lot. 
Really? Yeah. My stringers love me using Luxlon. Yeah. But I know Selenko are sending me some string now. They're green, mm-hmm. they're Hyper G string. Yeah, the Hyper G is very nice. That's quite popular with pro. I see a lot of pros using that. Yeah, the Hyper G is great, actually. The Hyper G is, is nice. Like they do, they're kind of their first string, kind of made them famous, especially in the States, was Torbite. Uh, oh, yeah. Selenko Torbite. I wouldn't, I'm not a big fan of Torbite. It's very, very stiff. They do Torbite Soft, which is very nice, which is actually, which is worth trying. Torbite Soft is nice. It's a little bit softer, a bit nicer on the arm and the feel is quite good. And then more recently, I think three years ago or four years maybe even, they came out with Hyper G. It's very nice. Just the color is a little bit leery for my taste. Yeah. You know, it comes in that neon green. It's a very nice string. They do, they're doing good stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, the leaders in polyester string still are Luxalon. Actually, do you know what, do you know what, Luxalon start like is what their main business is or why they what they started from. I have no idea. So they actually started off as and they still continue to do uh, strings for uh, for medical strings. So any kind of thread, any kind of so you know for um like for uh, stitches sort of, and it's a stitches for but for like high you know like really like high end detailed um, surgeries. They also do you know threading for spacesuits for oh, wow. you know fire or. Oh, yeah, all this kind of yarn, string, thread, that's always what they've specialized in. So like textile strings, so textile thread is what they kind of specialized in. And their factory is um, it's in Belgium, if I remember right. Yes, Belgium. And it's quite a small factory and they uh, it's quite a close-knit um, setup that they have. And that's they have, from all the, obviously all the other processes that they've done, they've come up with sort of some additives that, that does still kind of hold them a little bit above the rest of the rest of the kind of the pack. There are brands that they're closing in, you know, they're finding different ways that, you know, it's, it always comes with trial and error. I mean, like you said, Selinko doing very nice strings, Avala as well, doing quite good strings. Head is starting to come out with some very nice strings as well. So they all the other brands are catching up to them. So the reason, yeah, that they are that good is because they started with textile strings. I did speak to, I was at, I was at, I was at the French Open, speaking thing to the Dunlop rep over there. Mm-hmm. And they were saying like, they just can't figure out what Luxlon do to make their strings so good. And exactly. It's just like it said, it's important. You can't compete with them because they just can't figure out their secret sauce, which is, look, it's great to have a business like that. Yeah, of course. So just going to, there was, there was a question on tennis elbow and wrist problems. And for me, Luxlon helped a lot with tennis elbow. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Is there any other string? If I came to you and said, hey, Nikki, tennis elbow, <sighs> I'm struggling. What string should yeah. I use? What's the softest uh, string out there? Yeah. That's Alo, not going to break Alo, every hour. Yeah, Alo Power Soft is nice. It will break quite fast. The Yonex, uh, what's it called? The bright yellow string is called Polytor, maybe? It was also quite, yeah, Polytor, that's it. It's also quite fairly arm friendly. It's quite nice. And then Head as well. They do a string called Lynx, just normal Lynx Head. Is that the blue string? Uh, no, that's Lynx Edge, okay. which is a little bit stiffer. But yeah, head links is um, is like the core string from from that from that range. That's very nice on the arm. It's very it's actually very nice. It's actually I I recommend it as well for a lot of the juniors that are kind of transitioning from using either um, a um, a mixed uh, a hybrid yeah. or you know synthetic string if they're quite young and then they want to use polyester strings. It's got that's quite a good uh, transition string as well for them and also for, uh, for oh and actually actually I should, I should give a little shout out to. Uh, Robin Sodling, uh, they do a string. I don't know if you've tried their string. They, uh, they were really string. good. Yeah, they do a string called Leon. Yeah, that's their. Uh, that's very nice and soft as well. So there are definitely softer strings. But if, if you do have arm trouble, stay away from 4G, stay away from yes. regular Alu Power, stay away from RPM Blast, because these are strings that are going to... Yeah. Know, they're, 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 they're because they hold that much tension, you know, but obviously that tension has to go somewhere and it generally goes through your arm, unfortunately. Initially, when Function Tennis started, we reached out to Robin Sodling and they sent me so much string. I still have it here uh-huh. and hats and everything. I didn't go with the Leon string. I went for the Paris string. I just thought I really it was like that Paris string as well. It's really nice. A bit softer, but compared to Luxlon, the feel is just a completely different ball game, I felt. Mm, yeah, I... Yeah, yeah. It but anyway, yeah, it's, it was I mean, still a good string, reasonably priced string. Yeah, exactly. I, no, I like, I like. They've done really nice stuff. Their balls actually, actually very nice as well. They do. I don't know if you've tried their balls. I they have, do a white yeah. can. The white can has improved quite a lot on the black can, in my opinion. The white can is very. I can't remember what it's called. Tor, maybe. 
I can't remember, but it's a very nice ball. I like it a lot. And their strings are nice. Yeah, I think I think for the price, and so, I think they're very good. And their grips are good as well. So no, he's done a really nice job. They've done a really good job of creating a brand because it's not easy to create a string no. and ball brand. So much competition from the big guys. You need a lot of money to invest. But I think they've done a really nice job. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Okay, so we're going to move on to a few questions on rackets here. Now, Simon from Top Tennis Training always loves to ask some interesting yeah. questions that cause a bit of trouble. But he goes, <laughs> it's, I know, how many pro players actually play with the racket that the sponsor claims that they play with? I do know Head now putting yeah. their advertisement that player may not actually play with this racket. Yeah. Specs may yeah, differ. Yeah, yeah. You see all the pro mm-hmm. player rackets, you string a lot of them. How mm-hmm. many of them actually play with a racket you can buy off the shelf? A few of them, no, a few of them do, like quite a few of them actually do. Because you have to remember as well, the reason that they play with different models, not necessarily because the model is better than the one that they're selling at the moment. It's just because it's the one that they've always played with, which often is what people forget. They're like, oh, but he's using the old blade or the old radical or the old pursuit. That must mean that's better. No, it doesn't mean it's better or worse. It just means that that's the one that he's used for throughout his career. As anyone that knows a tennis player knows that they're creatures of habit and they don't want to change. But for example, Roger, he uses the, the racket you can buy in the store. You know, it's exactly the same. I mean, he, he has them personalized or ever so slightly. But yeah, his racket's off, you know, the same. A lot of the guys using the blade, Goffin, like I said, you have the guys using the radical, Schwarzman, he's using the radical. There are plenty of guys. And then, I mean, they're always using the rackets made by, I mean, nearly, well, pretty much always using rackets made by the company that they're endorsing. There was a rumor before, no, that yeah. he's playing with a Wilson racket painted as a head. No, I mean, that doesn't really happen. That doesn't happen. You know, that they are all using rackets made by the company that they're endorsing. But of course, you know, they don't want to change. Racket models are changing every year, you know, and you can't, it doesn't make sense uh, for players. Have, like, they shouldn't have to change frame if they're happy with the frame that they have every every year. So so it's it's more a question of habit more than like people get caught up thinking, oh, pro stock rackets are better. They're using that racket because it's better or because the new ones aren't as good. A lot of the new rackets they're making are great. And you have to remember also the younger generation are going to be using, you know, the rackets that are coming out now in 15 years time are going to be the old pro stock classic rackets where like, right now we're like, oh no, I don't want to use the current model yeah. uh, radical. It's not as good as the old one or the prestige or whatever or the blade. But in 15 years, they're going to be the classic rackets and people are, oh, such a good racket. It's more a so, hype, people creating something out of nothing. They do usually use... It's the usual, you want what you can't have. But if anybody's listening here, whatever racket you have now stored away, so in 15 years time, you actually still yes. have it. Yes, yeah, so no, I agree. And I did hear, you did mention Goffin. I did hear that somebody, somebody told me that Goffin uses off the shelf, doesn't even customise it. He just uses it the, exactly the way yeah. it comes off the shelf, which is great to yeah. hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does happen. What's a similar, I know we talked a bit about Murray's old racket, the old, the blue pro tour, the, the Thomas Muster racket. What's a similar racket to that now? If I wanted to buy one from Tennis Warehouse today, what's mm-hmm. the closest racket to that? I mean, the current model had prestige, to be honest. The 1820 mid-plus prestige. I mean, it's the same mold, you know. It's just the layout. It's the, obviously, the materials have also changed from, you know, so that's also why things, you know, that players are using different older rackets because the materials have changed, but they like the older materials or they like the materials they used to use. doesn't mean that they're better or worse. Uh, I mean, I would argue that the current model rackets of all the brands are better than most of their older ones. There are, obviously, there are exceptions that, you know, that they've made mistakes. For example, Babylon made, you know, a little mistake with their trying to change the the string pattern on or the string setup on one of the, like their pure drives. And so, like, but they could revert back and they change, you know, but in general, yeah, if someone does want a something similar to the old uh, Pro Tour, um, yeah, it's, it's the current mid okay. uh, prestige. Great. And this is a very technical question. What, what's the difference between a tubular and a square frame? Well, square frame, I guess, is fairly obvious. It means that, you know, that it's kind of all the... The angles are quite like they're all right angles to the to the frame. For example, the Prestige is a is a square beam square beam racket. There aren't actually that many about these days. Most of the rackets change in beam width or in beam shape. So, for example, the Aero Drive uh, or the Pure Aero, I think it's called now, the one that uh, Rafa uses. You know, it has that kind of very distinctive aerodynamic throat, and then it goes up to like a thicker, wider beam at the top. It's normally because it increases swing speed. It can increase stability, torsion. Whereas a square beam actually makes the racket experience a little bit more dead and it can actually move a bit more. And that's kind of why I think companies have moved away from that because it means the racket has to be heavier to be stable. 
you know, because obviously now nowadays, you know, you can have a great solid feeling racket that only weighs 280 grams or 290 grams, which in a square beam would be impossible. And that's because of the physics in the in the setup of the of the frame. What's an ideal racket for a 12 year old? Um, who plays a bit, by the way, sorry, 12 year olds who play like four times a week and is playing tournaments. Okay. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, the thing is always, I mean, with any racket for any player, uh, young, old, it's always relative to their physical capabilities, to their, you know, to their tennis level. For a 12 year old that is, you know, that is competing, I would look for a racket around 300 grams, plus or minus, depends as well is if, if they're, you know, strong or if they're bigger for their age, small for their age. But yeah, somewhere between, let's say, 285 to no more than 305 grams. You want as well, I like, for example, re- more recently, there's been this big wave of like big spin rackets, you know, where they have very, very open string patterns. I can't, I, I personally try and stay away from them because they just, you lose a lot of feeling of the strings break a lot so you know it's not ideal for the parents and so i would say you know like a anywhere between plus give or take 290 grams plus or minus probably a 16 19 string pattern you know which is enough to give them you know stay in power but they still get feeling they still get feedback from the from the racket and um yeah i wouldn't around 100 square inch head which to be honest most of the rackets in that weight range will be 100 square inch head one other question to hear was what was a good racket for top spin but you recommend anybody who's looking for top spin should look at it like a 16 19 string pattern yeah i mean for example top spin again it, it comes from a lot of players a lot of people ask me oh um what would what string would help my serve or what racket would be better for my forehand and then my the answer that i want to give is always maybe take more tennis lessons you know because at the end of the day a racket can help you know but it won't it won't solve won't solve the problem you know for, for top spin either the reason you're not getting to enough top spin is either because the racket's too heavy you can't swing it fast enough the string pattern is too dense so it means you know that maybe you're playing with an 18 20 so look for a more open string pattern but again i wouldn't go any bigger than 16 19 16 18 there's also 18 16 uh, but the gaps are very very big you're going to lose a lot of control again i wouldn't i'm not a big fan personally so i would just stick to the kind of the classic 16 19 and then look at the strings the strings do make a difference try a couple of, let's say, string oriented, uh, spin oriented strings that will probably help you more than the racket itself. I mean, if you're using a sensible racket, then you then the strings would generally be a better better option for you. Great. Okay, last racket question. And you yeah. touched on this earlier about Novak extended mm-hmm. his racket, but what are the pros and cons of extended rackets? Yeah, so the pros and cons um, are so normally all rackets come at a sort of regular length. Which, if I'm not mistaken, is six. Oh, I should know this. Um, I, know. <laughs> I think it's yeah. I think it's sixty nine and a half inches. Just that, yeah. And the longer the racket is, the more power you get. So you get more power. You obviously, I mean, whenever a lever is longer, you get more. Um, you get more power. So obviously, if you have longer arms, if you have a longer racket, you're going to get more power. But obviously, the lot further away you are from the point of impact. So the longer the racket is, the less control you're going to get. The more um, movement you're going to get in the racket, it's going to be harder to, to control. So for, I generally don't recommend extended rackets. Obviously, someone like Novak can, I mean, he could play with a stick if he wanted to, you know. So I generally recommend sticking to um, to a regular length, yeah, 27-inch uh, regular length frame because when you, go, when you go above that, the racket starts to move. They're also more difficult to find to be honest, and that extra little bit of, I would first, if someone wants more power, instead of looking to get a longer racket, I would try again adjusting either the specs of the racket or the tension of the strings. You know, lower the tension if you want a little bit more power because, um, yeah, unless you have a very good reason to wanting an extended racket, I would kind of stick to regular length, 27-inch racket. Great. There was a time, I remember years ago, where Prince were, uh, maybe a few other brands mm. were into the extended rackets and yeah. they were quite popular, but they've died down now. So, yeah, yeah because players are, you know, they're serving so hard, they hit the ball so hard, they just can't control the ball in the same way. If you hit very flat or kind of smooth strokes, then, um, then you can do it. Actually, do you remember Xavier Melis? Yes. Yeah, he used to use that, uh, what was it called? I think it was called the Prince. Diablo maybe the red one and that was the, the the longest you could have a racket was 29 inches and it was literally like a broomstick yeah but again you just the only few players I mean Novak is using a half inch longer they just put a bit extra on the grip or does it mould it directly do head 
directly make that for mm. him? Generally, all rackets come. So when a racket is made, obviously you have a, a carbon that goes into a mold, and that mold is then open. And that, the, so the shaft of the racket where the grip would go is all nearly always. I think it's even thirty inches. Like, like it makes the racket thirty inches in okay. length, and then the racket's always cut regular length and then the pallet or the mold is put on so obviously for him the hairpin of the racket could be any length obviously within regulation so they basically they just cut the racket at a different length so next nikki we're just going to move into to the racket mod section to the customization section and i'm going to kick off with what are the benefits of a leather grip mm. um so leather grips obviously were popular years ago and they um a lot of pro players use leather grips the, the benefits of a leather grip basically allows you to feel the bevels of the grip more. It also gives you a firmer contact. So you actually, again, you, you'll end up getting more vibration through your arm or through your hand. But that all, so basically the vibrations of a racket are basically feedback from how you're hitting the ball. So for pro players, obviously, the more feedback they get, the better. But again, for recreational players, if you're using a leather, a leather grip, it's quite tough on the hand. Obviously, it's a lot harder. It's a lot firmer than the synthetic grips. You know, you can end up with sore hands. You can end up with, you know, blisters. And you're going to get more tension through the elbow, through your arm, through your wrist. It's just the question of feedback. You know, you can feel the edges of the rackets. You can find the grip, you know, the, the grip you need for the shot slightly better, slightly faster, um, and you just get that firm feeling. So it's, that's that, that kind of the main benefit. Fran, when he did up my radicals, did put some leather mm-hmm. grips on them and I thought yeah. they're great. I remember as a kid trying them with the old princes yes. and I thought they were rough like... But now, actually, I really enjoyed it and I wish I'd done it sooner. Is there any particular brand you recommend? I see P1 have their own letter grip. What's the best yeah. letter grip brand? Ashway, is that is there a brand called Ashway? Yeah, there's a brand called Ashway. No, sorry, Fairway. Do the bit, like, Fairway. They're kind of, Fairway, they're kind of the classic. Ashway is a string band that make, uh, they make squash strings. Fairway, yeah, it's kind of the classic. Yeah, they use a, like a high grade leather. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, there's kind of again the, the ones that like that are most sought after are the head calf skin leather grips, which are kind of again they kind of just the, the pro players. There are a few ways of getting them, but they get to be honest, the Wilson leather grips are quite fine for me. Actually, the best sort of off the shelf you have gamma ones, so you can get I think from tennis warehouse, you can get them from string for you can get them from different places, and they they're. Very nice. So basically, the most important thing about the leather grips is that when you stretch them, they don't deform too much. They don't stretch too much, so they should be firm and that they're consistent in width. And actually, a lot of the main factor of a leather grip is actually the person putting the leather grip on. If a leather grip is applied badly, it's horrible. You could have a great leather grip applied badly and it will feel terrible. And if you have even a bad leather grip applied well, it will feel nice. So it's actually more a question of the application than anything else. I remember Nate. I think it was Nate from P1 once said, if you don't get hand cramp while applying a leather grip, you haven't put it on properly. Love it. One of my que- one of the questions was that I got was like, I need to see a leather yes. grip being put on properly. So that's what I'm going to ask yeah. you for it over the next while. No rush to get a nice video of a leather grip. Yeah, we'll do a yeah, we'll do a we'll do a cool video of that. Yeah, we can do that for you. No problem. Great. Okay, so briefly talk about weight on a racket. So. What's the difference between putting weight on the handle, weight on the top of the frame, or weight at six and nine o'clock? What's the main differences? Okay, so yeah, so obviously depending on where you add weight, and normally when we add weight, we use lead tape, uh, which is kind of what you'll see on kind of the outside of the frame. Sometimes it's under the bumper. So you have three ways of measuring the racket. You have the static weight, which is just the weight, pure weight of the racket when you put it on a scale. Then you have the balancing point of the racket, which is when which is at which point when the racket's flat on a, let's say, flat on a table, it's at what point, for example, if you push the racket to the edge of the table, at what point does the racket just balance before it falls off? This is called the balancing point. Or if you have it on your you know, finger or, or wherever, that's called the balancing point. And then you have the third mark, which is uh, swing weight, which is actually the weight of the racket when it's swinging, which is measured just a swing. It's called a swing weight, swing weight machine, funny enough. That'll uh, give you a a reading of of the racket when it's moving, which is which is actually often one of the most important ones because obviously that's kind of the, the weight that we feel. That's why sometimes you, you can hold a racket and you be like, oh, this is this feels really heavy, and then you actually go away and it's not, or vice versa. You can be like, oh, this feels very nice. This doesn't feel too heavy, and that's because of the swing weight. So depending on where you place the racket, it affects. The higher up the racket, it'll increase the swing weight a lot more, and it'll make it more head heavy meaning it'll give you more power, but it'll be more difficult to swing. And then if you add it more to the grip, it'll mean the racket's going to be easier to maneuver, so you can swing it faster, you can you can um, accelerate it quicker, however you won't get as much power through the wall. Which one provides a better stable racket? 
Yeah, so if you want stability, so if you feel that, for example, the racket is twisting ever so slightly when you play or it's moving slightly, then we often, you'll see a lot of weight being added kind of around the sweet spot zone, which is kind of just above three and nine, kind of 10, like 10 and two, three and nine, something like that. It's kind of the zone where you hit the ball and that just the extra weight basically adds weight to the plow through. So when you hit through the ball, that weight is getting pushed with the ball through the ball and you get just a more stable feel and a little bit more power through the, through the shot. Okay, great. And you mentioned swing weight there. Somebody asked, what's the best swing weight machine? Um, there are a couple of swing weight machines. So Babalat do like a whole diagnostic center. It's nice, but it's a very, very expensive. I think it's around six, five, six thousand euros. Yeah. And that'll tell you also the flex of the racket. It'll tell you the swing weight. It'll tell you the, the, um, the like the string bed dynamic tension. It can tell you a whole host of things. And then you have the machine that I use, which is the, the head three in one swing weight machine which is it's great it looks very nice it's, i don't know if you've seen it it's it's, it's it looks great but that will that will do obviously the static weight uh has nice electrical scale then it'll do the balance point and then it'll do the swing weight as well so that's obviously why it's called three one and that i can't remember the exact retail price i think it's around about just between 1500 to 2000 euros and that will for example, if you buy that, then you can do all the customizing your heart desires. It'll, it'll be able to, you know, and it's a, it's a great machine. You can set up a nice business. Yeah, and you, it's not too big. If you do need to move around a bit, it's it's not, you know, you can pick it up, move it around. It's smaller than a, str- than a string machine. And then you have my colleague, Fran, he's using just, it's called the Dunlop swing weight machine, and that just measures swing weight. So it's a slightly even smaller unit, and that'll just do the swing weight, which is nice. It's quite handy. It's quite small. But for like a, if you want the full full kind of package let's say then i think you know the head three and one is, is a nice nice option at least i like it a lot yeah the old popular one was the prince prince one they did they did a prince three and one but that doesn't doesn't exist anymore so it's quite difficult to to find this is kind of the uh yeah the next in line i think my pro shop in dublin here the club i'm at have one the prince one rings a bell but uh, yeah but green and kind of yeah. see-through green see-through yeah that's yeah that's the one so tell me uh, so if I'm a player and I was like, God, my rackets all feel different or I want to change something, but I like my rackets. What, how do I go about finding the perfect spec for me? Well, obviously, whenever you buy two rackets or more, the chance of them being slightly different is nearly 100%. It's very, very high. They say now plus or minus seven grams on any Pacific racket, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only brand that does very, very good, accurate, off-the-shelf specs is Yonex that uh, they they do a really yeah they do a very nice job on the quality control of their other specs otherwise Wilson ahead there yeah, they have plus or minus seven grams of um, of a difference which is a lot and it also means that sometimes for example you could you could buy four rackets and you could give me four rackets oh, I want them all the same and I can tell you to be honest it's nearly impossible to find the ideal specs I mean you need to speak to someone that knows what they're doing with regards to customizing. And then if you have an idea of how you play, so, okay, I'm, I'm you know, six foot tall, I have a one-handed backhand, I like to play aggressive, then normally I would say within three tests, I can normally narrow, I can normally find something you like. You know, if, I mean, if you're able to explain to me, okay, this is how I play, and if you send me a video or if, or if I see how you play, this is what I've been playing with, this is kind of what I like, but I feel I need a bit more power i need i feel like i can't really sometimes swing the racket fast enough or you know as long as you give me some kind of you know good feedback then within um within and we normally do kind of two or three test frames for clients or for players and then within those two or three tests we can normally narrow it down to okay uh, this is the one i like or i really like this one but it's maybe just a little bit too heavy and then i say okay that's it then we can do four of them exactly the same or whatever two of them or six of them however many rackets you have you do work with people like this where they send you videos yes. messages then mm-hmm. they send you the rackets and you send them back a few rackets and then they pick which one they want yes. exactly yes we do yeah i mean obviously the um, yeah we do um video analysis work which is great it helps a lot because obviously when someone just tells us hey i I I need more like we were talking about earlier. I want more topspin on my on my forehand. Where, where should I put the weight? And then <clears throat> without seeing them play, I'm you know okay. Well, maybe put a bit in the head because it will increase you know the um, the power in the racket and you swing it or whatever. But then if I see that they you know using the wrong grip to get topspin or whatever, then it helps. It helps a lot with regards to finding the right specs. And yeah, we do that for um, we do it for 
not just for pro players, we do it for club players, you know, recreational players, anyone that, you know, that feel, okay, are, you know, that are keen tennis players that want a bit more out of their racket. And I'd always recommend, you know, anyone that plays regularly that want, that has more than one racket should ideally get them at least matched, you know, like not everyone needs to have a perfectly customized racket exactly for them. But if you have more than one, so you have two of the same racket, take them to your sort of local string or customizer and just ask them to make them the same. You know, that, that means if you break a string, the next one you pick up is the same. You don't need to have a favorite racket. Yeah, uh, that I'd always recommend. Most people normally have a favorite racket and they don't know why it's their favorite racket. Exactly. But these are reasons why it could be their favorite racket because they are different weights and the sweet spot exactly. could be different or just so, yes, finally, we can get them problems sorted. Now, every racket can be your favorite racket. Exactly, exactly. There's a question here that I thought was a wrong question, but maybe you can tell me if it's not. The question was from Gary over in New York was, how accurate mm-hmm. is silicone versus lead tape putting weight in rackets? I replied back and said, Gary, I think you only put silicone in the bottom of the racket, in the grip handle. Mm-hmm. And he goes, no, no, you can put silicone in the frame of the racket. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I'll ask the expert. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, you, do, you don't want to put silicone in the frame. Silicone only just goes in the in. So if you open up the trap door of a racket, you'll see that it goes into the the bottom shaft of the racket. It's very accurate. Yeah, it's great. Obviously, you know roughly how much silicone. I mean, obviously, in experience, you know you get to know how much silicone you need to put in to roughly get whatever weight you need. But then you know you put a bit in, you weigh it, make sure it's right. You go you know bit by bit, step by step. And obviously, then as well, depending how deep in the racket grip. You put the silicone, it will also adjust the weight and the swing weight. So that's why, you know, like customizing rackets is quite a delicate art. But I wouldn't, yeah, no, uh, you don't, wouldn't put silicone in the actual, like in the head frame of the of the racket. You might see that some rackets have foam, like a lot of the Wilson rackets have foam in them. But that's done in the factory and that's part of the makeup of the racket. Okay. You know, is that foam, but that's not, that's not injected afterwards. That's what I thought. Do any pros play with a swing weight less than 320, which I assume is a very fast racket? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, uh, I mean, depends also as well as the swing weight, 320 with strings or without strings. But if it's with strings, yeah, I would, yeah, there, there will be plenty, especially on the feet. Especially, you know, on the women's tour. I did hear Dominic Team plays with a really fast moving racket. Yeah, I mean, I'm not 100%, but I think he uses a racket with, yeah, that is quite grip heavy that makes it, you know, it, that you can swing it very fast. So there are, I, I, have, I don't know what's the lowest swing weight I've seen, I don't remember, because obviously as well, I only see, I only test or see the rackets that I work with. For example, you know, if you're at a tournament or you're stringing, you don't, you know, you don't kind of, check out the specs yeah no you're too busy and also just you know at the end of the day like they're personal to, to the player you know and some players don't like you know don't want their specs shared some players don't mind yeah we can't we, we you know we, we leave it up to the player to kind of if it, whether or not they want to kind of release their specs or not great okay we're going to move on to the yeah. last section which is only have a couple of questions but it's basically mm-hmm. on painting rackets which you and Unstrung have become world leaders in yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I've seen some of your painted rackets they're really good the quality is amazing first we have a question from Lucas who says can you paint a racket at home yeah well so so basically we the reason or the way we got into racket painting was actually I um, uh, I was just finishing playing I was playing a few more tournaments and I didn't have a contract left on my racket sponsors so I just decided to get my racket painted black you know I thought it'd be cool I just got guy that paints racket uh, that paints cars sorry just to kind of spray it. I took the grommets out and I just got them to spray it, spray the racket black at the time you know I wasn't thinking of the weight I mean yeah. I knew it would increase the weight but I wasn't you know I, it was just like okay just paint them black and it'll be fine you know and that's what I did and then we posted a couple of photos on Instagram and people were like oh awesome and um, and then from there it kind of grew bit by bit we were doing a lot a lot of testing to kind of get to where we're at now I mean we're still trying to get better and better all the time like anything but in answer to your question yes you can paint them home you need patience and i guess as well kind of a good touch to being a little bit artistic because so for example if you do want to paint a racket at home i mean i i wouldn't i definitely wouldn't advise doing it inside at home i'd maybe do it in the garage or somewhere covered but basically the process is quite simple we um in the sense that we sand the rackets down so we remove the current paint job of the racket because obviously this as well now whenever we paint a racket we, re- we return the racket within plus or minus two grams that we received the rackets in you know which is quite good 
and they they keep the same feeling, the same flex. So we uh, so they do come back feeling the same. Because obviously their questions would get, oh, well, my racket feels the same. Will it be the same weight? Blah, blah. But yes, at least when we paint them, they come back. They'll come back to the same. But if you're going to paint them at home, you want to sand the racket down, take your time, remove all the all the paint, and then you know, like like you would kind of paint anything. You want to you need to primer them, and like anything, if you you know, it's worth getting good quality stuff. And then you can use what paint do you recommend to paint at home? I would recommend going to. Uh, do you, do you guys have, you know, like a Halfords, like a like a car parts auto store type thing? Yeah, auto store. Yeah, exactly. It's because obviously, if you're going to paint them at home, you don't need to get, you know, a spray gun. You don't need to get, you know, the whole setup. You can do, you can do a fairly decent job with spray cans with some practice. And I would recommend if you're going to try at home, I would try, I would try with that. So yeah, so go and get, to, you know, go to your kind of auto store, get some uh, some primer, and then you know, get you know the color that you want or the couple of colors that you like. And is it spray or paint? This is uh, spray. Like you could do it from home. You can do it with spray cans. So like spray paint. There are only, I mean, there are a couple of different types of spray cans, but definitely for this, uh, or like try and get the ones that you use for cars, so on, because they're high pressure. You want high pressure cans. For example, graffiti spray paint is low pressure, which means the, the paint comes out a lot slower, which just for, for painting rackets is, is very difficult. Stay away from graffiti cans, but yeah, you can try, yeah, any kind of, any high pressure paint can, again, you're gonna, you might find that some paints that like different brands that mix with other paints. You know, they might, you know, and again, it comes with technique. You might get an orange peel, which is kind of when it, well, when the, the paint basically looks like orange peel. But you can, it can be done. You can do, um, you, you know, you can do some kind of quite nice, simple designs. And then obviously after you let it dry, and then you want to add a um, add a lacquer to the racket and let that dry nice and hard. Obviously, the one thing that they do in the factory that we can't do, the rackets are painted before the grips are applied which basically means that they can be um, they can be put in an oven. So they dry a lot faster, a lot harder, a lot quicker. Whereas you want to have the grip on, you need to just be patient and let them dry for um, three to five days. Unless you're getting a, a new custom mold. Exactly. Then you could take the, exactly. Yes. Then you could take it off and then we pop them in the oven so it helps. Okay. Um, so yeah. So it's good. It sounds anybody can do it. So guys, give it a go. Mm-hmm. And so if I want to send you my racket to be done, what's the time frame? So the time frame is usually 10 days, give or take, from when we receive the rackets. Because obviously, you know, within with each colour, with each layer, you need we need to let the, the paint dry around sort of 12 to 24 hours. So obviously, say, you know, you have a design with three different colours, four different colours, that just in drying time, that's nearly three three days of, of drying time. Four days of drying, plus you need to sand them, plus when the lacquer goes on, we leave them, we try to leave them for 48 hours before we put the bumpers on, before we stream them or anything like that. So that's why it takes roughly 10 days, give or take, from when we receive the frame. Great. Well, look, uh, Nikki. Yeah, you answered all the pain questions right there. So thanks for that. Perfect. If anybody's looking for any information on modern rackets, on painting rackets, on anything got to do with rackets, you can contact Nikki on Instagram yeah. at Unstrung Customs or through their website yeah. at unstrungcustoms.com. But I have one last question for you. It's a big question. How yeah. many rackets have you strung in your stringing career? <laughs> That's a very good question. I would say close 10,000 maybe, I think I would say. Yeah, I would actually. I would. I would say yeah, close, maybe more than ten thousand rackets. Great. Well, fair play. That's where. That's a lot of experience there. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's a lot. Of practice. Congrats on a great string career so far, and all the best to Unstrung Customs in the future. Thank you very much. That was great. Very informative. I can't wait to our audience to hear this and get their yeah, questions it answered. It was very informative. I didn't know a lot of this stuff as well, and I've been in tennis a long time, so it was great to get the information from a great source. So thank you very much. Perfect. Pleasure. Yeah, it was great. It was fun. Hope you found that interesting. I really did and learned so much from it. If you happen to know anybody who's into strings, rackets or customization, please share this podcast with them. Again, uh, thanks for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe button and I'll catch you next week. Bye.